say in the first part today you've seen that before but I don't think you've seen too much of the last bits. Well the you have seen those of you took the 2418 linear marks course. And we get back to what is the, the core of the course, namely prediction, and then maybe some examples at the end, just see how long time we use for that. So, the most general form of regression model is basically to say, well, you have some observations and output that you want to model, and then you have some functional relationship that depends on some independent variable x, could be a vector of elements at each point in time that you observe, could depend on time, and of course it could depend on some unknown parameters. But if you knew everything, the regression part was maybe not so interesting. And then we have this epsilon here again, kind of describing the unknown, the noise, or lack of fit. And you can see one of our challenges is how to describe that. So far, I would assume most of you in the module you make you have assumed that the epsilons are independent and identically distributed. But they're not always that. So that is even the core of today and to some extent the rest of this course. A more general representation is to say that the epsilon here may have a covariance. There's a global variance at time t. And then there's a correlation structure between the different elements. That's what we're going to look closely into. Today, we will focus on a case where xt is non-random, so we'll write lowercase xt. So we are back today, we're taking a one step backwards from the last week, where we assumed that everything was random. But now we go back to the ordinary setting where you say, I know the independent variables 100%. There's no uncertainty there. We we'll get back to the other case, but it's just the basic start of it. So one expression could be something like this. In this case, there are two parameters. This is, you can say, the reference one. If we change the tree, we can shift the curve forward and backwards. If we change theta 1, then we can magnify or reduce 
the signal. And if we change the, the two up here, what we do is that we change the slope of the curve and that it passes halfway through between the minimum and the maximum. This is a classical sigmoid function. Now, one thing we'll get back to later is linearity. So, out of those three parameters up here, are there any where this function can be assumed linear? Typical linear regression model setting. Would it be linear in any of these? Close to zero, close to x zero. Not close to x zero, I'm asking about the variables, so the parameters, sorry. Theta 1, theta 2, or theta 3. Yes? So the function is linear in theta 1, exactly. Whereas theta 2 and theta 3 are wrapped in an exponential function and the inverse, so it's definitely non linear there. And you can say the typical case is that you have some data let's just assume that we have something that looks like this and I can keep adding points but how would I do this? one example where you have this Structure is if you have, say, the wind speed out here. And the power production from a wind turbine. Then you'll see something like this. Until some point where the wind speed gets too high and it just stops. So that's very nonlinear, but we tend to design wind turbines so that they don't get into that machine. So often, and when that happens, it's a special case. So let's not focus on that right now. So, what we look at here is a general nonlinear case. What we want to do when we want to estimate something is that well, we have some observation and we have some predictors, they're co corresponding in pairs. And if we do what's called ordinary least squares, also unweighted, another term that is used in that regard. Basically, we want to find the data that minimizes the sum of squared of signals. So we want to minimize the square of the observation minus the function of the parameters evaluated at the input variables. Here I think at the t as input, but that could as well be the case. We sum over all observations or all times, and we can write it like this as the sum of the squared epsilons. Now, I like to do things not like a lot of sums, but I like to do it using uh, matrices and vectors. So, if you look at this element up here, is of theta, the sum t equals 1 to n of epsilon t theta square. I write epsilon t as a function of theta because the epsilon is a function of what the function is for the given parameters. When you write this, in a different way. Any bright ideas? We have a sum of all the square of elements. Yes? As a dot product? Yes. So if we have a vector of all the epsilons. Vector, and we take the inner product of that.
This is the way we want to continue doing these things. Sometimes we write the sums, but we like to do it as the inner product. Now, this estimate, if you optimize this by minimizing this, the sum of square residuals, then we have to, at least to get reliable estimates, we can easily just run the algorithm and say it's an algorithm. But to get something that's reliable, the errors must be assumed to have the same variance and be independent. <coughs> That's something you've done before. What happens if they're not? I don't know if you consider that at all. But what happens, I can say just briefly, is that the variance estimate is wrong, first of all. And you may also get some parameters that are just meaningless. It depends a lot on the structure. I'll show you examples later on. So, assume is that the model errors are IID. Do you recall what IID is short for? Independent and normal distributed? Independent and identically distributed. Yeah. We will also often assume that they're normally distributed. So thank you for saying that word as well. Um, but in general it does not have to be normally distributed, just identically distributed. That means the same variance as well. Whereas if you just say normally distributed, you're not saying that they are also having the same variance. Now, the typical estimate that we use of the variance is to take the sum of square residuals and normalize by n minus p. And the n minus p, the minus p comes from the fact that we estimated p parameters. So we had n observations, we used p degrees of freedom for the parameters, and this is what we're left with. This helps us in the sense that if you have a model with many parameters, we can reduce the sum of square residuals effectively to zero if we have one parameter per observation, or a saturated model. In that case, you have n minus n here, so the variance is undefined, which makes somewhat sense. Generally, we want n to be much larger than p, but we are sometimes in situations where it's not so much larger. And in the general setting, we can also, using this estimate, we can get an estimate of the variance of the parameters Look back here, we estimate the parameters by minimizing the sum of square residuals, and then we get the variance as this expression. So the variance of data, and I use this hat a lot of places to indicate that it's an estimated variable parameter, is 2 times our estimated sigma, or it could be a known sigma, but I mean, in reality, whenever you have some data, you will not necessarily know what is the true underlying sigma. So, we will write it like this. And then we have the second order partial derivative with respect to theta of this is which is the sum of square residuals, and we take the inverse of that, and we evaluate this at theta equals theta hat. So, what is the intuition about this? I do like when intuition matches with you can say the facts. So I have the second order derivative of the sum of square residuals. <coughs> With the second order derivative, what does that represent? That's the curvature around the optimal. So it's when you look at a 
just say we have one parameter here, and then we look at how our sum of scale residuals is evaluated around some optimal value, then often you will have something that looks like a problem. And the second order derivative is the curvature down here. It could do weird things out here. What we care about is how does it behave near the minimum. Now, what says there is that it is the inverse of the curvature. So if the curvature is high, like this, the variance is low of the estimator. If the curvature is small, the variance is larger. Well, intuitively, it makes a lot of sense. If the curvature is large, you have a lot of information. The definition of the minimum is well defined as well. So, this is one of the cases I like in that sense. Now, that was the, you can say, just ordinary v squares. The problem with this is. Well, in order to do this, you generally need to do some numerical optimization. But I also said last week that we will mostly focus on linear systems. So in linear models, things are not nicer. Because if you take a model, say the general linear model, which I assume that you all heard of to some extent, or just a linear regression model, and not to be confused with the generalized linear model. For those of you who do not know the difference, the very, very short difference definition is that the general linear model, that's where we will assume that the epsilon is normally distributed. When you have the generalized, we'll look at other distributions. Not the best definition, but just to say a little bit. The generalized is basically just a broader family. That includes the general linear model as a subcase. So, then assume we can have the model on this form. <coughs> and then let's look at a model here. And now the question is can we represent this as a general linear model? Is this model linear in the parameters? Because what we have is effectively some parameters that are just multiplied on some coefficients. And we just have to say, well, we'll invent a predictor one for the, you can say, the intercepts, <coughs> if you use normal. And then we can use any transformation of input variables as predictors. That's one important thing. It's only the linearity in the parameters not the linearity in the predictors or independent variables. Now, what we have is a lot of different subclasses. The general linear model, what I assume you've all seen is the linear regression model. I hope so. It could also be a multiple regression model. I don't know how many of you have done that. We have more than one predictor. Few. We'll do a lot of that in different contexts. So basically, that's where you say, well, if the x is has a higher dimension than one, then you do a model for regression. Could be say the height of plants described by age and concentration of some nutrients in the soil. It could be a lot of different things, but just take one example. And as a variance, I know we've all done this, maybe not as a, linear, a general linear model. You've all done that. Basically, you just have some classes here, and what you're estimating is the mean value within each class. And what you want to, the question is, does those mean values differ? It could be, say, the height of class described by different species. How do you code this as a general linear model? That's another story. Basically, what you do 
And as you write, you have so-called indicator variables. I will do that later at some point. Um, but now I'll just say it. So if you have two different species, you make a model where you say the first one is just the average height of this particular family of, of species. And then you take the, of the, of the one reference species and take the second column that is zero if the particular observation is not the species corresponding to the second column and it's one if it is corresponding to that. Then you get a, a parameter that represents the first one, what is the value for the reference species, and the second one represents how is the second one different from the reference. And then you can just, if you have a third species, you just add a third column. Keep going. So that's how you do it. In words and you can combine the two. What if you have both different species and you have some different predictors that you want to use? Then you can have these indicator variables and you can have some predictors there. <coughs> Basically just combining the two models above. Effectively these down here are just multiple regression models. Have different names for them. So this, and there's a covariance, and there's a variance. Short names, which you probably have heard, are ANOVA for the first one, and the second one we call that ANCOVA because of the CO that is in there. Written like this. There are more examples. <coughs> of this in the book and I won't get into this because it's not a linear regression course. But we will look into how do we make estimates on a linear regression. Well, as mentioned before, for the general case when you have non-linear linearities, you have to do numerical optimization. However, when we have a general linear model, we can write a closed form solution. That I sometimes like. So basically, what is it that we want to do? Well, we want to minimize the inner product of the epsilons. So how do we do that? on the screen where there's no light on it. Is that true? So, <coughs> I should turn this up a little bit. How do we, what do we do? If we want to minimize some of the residuals, now I will omit the function of theta, even though it is, but just because of notation, otherwise in a moment it becomes a little bit complex. Well, what does it mean to minimize something? How would you do that if it was not, yeah? Refine the derivative of the function. Yes. So I will find the derivative of a function. Now, how to do that, and I want to do it with respect to theta. These are our post function of theta. And if I write it out, what I have is y minus what we saw up here. I did not say it so. Finally, is if you take all observations from before and arrange all the predictors as vectors, we always have vectors as color vectors, so we have to transpose them to make them row vectors. Multiply these on that, then every single line corresponds to the expression that we had before for each observation. Every single row in this matrix and the corresponding element in the vector of observations. 
And this one, that's corresponding to one observation. So we just have all observations combined in one observation vector, one, and I'll call it a design matrix. Sometimes you are able to design your experiments. That means you can actually make sure you have some structure in here. Back to why that is important. You have some parameters here that are the same for all observations, and then you have the residuals of that. So I'll just write using this notation, but again with a lowercase x because it is known. So what to get the epsilon? We just have to take y minus x theta. And we need to transpose this, then y minus x theta again. So if we differentiate this with respect to theta, what do we get? Well, if we cannot ignore these uh, vector formula things, it's fairly easy. We just get through it and do sort of what we tend to do. And we have to keep in mind that we get a scalar in the end, so we should not be too careful about things. But when you differentiate something that is square, we get. So you get exactly you get a two times the derivative of you say one of the elements, so to speak. And what you get, if you get the derivative of this, then you have, you can say, this element here, x up here, you also get a minus out here, from this part here, and then you have to multiply on the other part, y minus x theta. You can also do it the traditional way, where you do it by parts, and you take it's the derivative of, of this one multiplied on that one plus this one multiplied on the derivative of this one. Then you just get not the two but everything else. And then you have these two terms here with and without transpose. I mean, swapped around. But since it's a scalar, it's the same. <coughs> and what you set up there as well was to say, well, to find Minimum, you will equate this to zero and solve that. So, first thing to do is, well, multiplying by minus two. It really doesn't matter at all when we want to equate them to zero. So, what we want to look at is x transpose y minus, and I'll just multiply it inside this parameter, minus x transpose x theta <coughs> equal to zero. Now, having this, it's fairly easy to just move the equal sign. Because I want it this way in a moment, I will have x t, uh, x transpose x theta on my left hand side, is equal to x transpose y. Now, what I care about is the estimate of theta. So how do I get from here to an estimate of theta? Yes, you multiply uh, by the inverse of x. Yes. I pre-multiply by the inverse of yeah. x transpose x on both sides, because then I get rid of this. There's only one part. If I can calculate it, that means if x transpose x has full rank. I can invert it. So x transpose x has to be invertible. That brings, that's the first coming back to the so-called design matrix, x. We have to make sure that the matrix x has full rank. Because otherwise, we won't be able to make an estimate. And then we might as well wait for some more observations or something 
so that we can actually do that. Because otherwise, we're just wasting our time. And I just like, just like wasting our time. I hope you do that to some extent as well. So, when x controls x is invertible, we can get an estimate say the hat that is equal to x transpose x inverse x transpose y. How many of you have seen this expression before? Most of you. That was also expected. So, that's the definition how we do things. Now, the various estimation have that there. How do we get to that? First of all, you see sigma hat square here is the inner product of the epsilon divided by n minus p. Now, how about the variance estimator here? Of course, it scales somehow with the variance that are on the observations. That is not just like up here. There are two ways, at least, to prove the variance expression. If we look at the estimator that we got down here, we can write it that we say that this here Everything but the y, we can label that as one matrix because it only consists of x transpose, x inverse, on x transpose. That's just something we can calculate, right? So if we define that L, well, what is it that we do? What is it that we want to calculate? We want to get an estimate of the variance of theta hat. That is the variance of L on Y. Because that's what we did down there. That's just the definition. Just do this to save a lot of characters along the way to make the calculation easier. Now, this here, if I <coughs> plug in what y is, I have L on x theta plus epsilon. Notice here that this is the true theta. It's not the estimated theta. So, are there any constants in here except for the L? Yes. X is known, theta is known, so the only thing that contributes to the variance is epsilon. So this is equal to the variance of L on epsilon. What is this equal to? Have a constant multiplied on a random variable. L squared, yes, if everything is a scalar, but it's not. That was what we looked at last week. So, I want to have something with the variance of epsilon in there. Yes? You have like... L transpose on the other side. Three multiplied by L and a post multiplied by L transpose when I move the L outside. Now the variance of epsilon, well that comes sort of from the definition, and that is that it's sigma squared, right? But keep in mind that this is a vector, so it's not just an element, so we have all the epsilon have the same variance. So we have sigma squared times the identity matrix to get a diagonal with only sigma squares, right? So I can write this 
I just moved the sigma, lowercase sigma square outside, and then I have the L, then I have the identity matrix in here. But we all agree that that doesn't matter. And then L transpose. And now I use my L, what it's writing x transpose, x inverse, x transpose a lot of times. But now I will reintroduce it. So I will write for L here x transpose x inverse x transpose that was the first L now when you transpose a product I don't know if you recall but what you do is that you transpose all the product uh, element of the product and you reverse the order so what I get is first I get x transpose transpose so that's x and then I get x transpose x inverse and I ought to transpose that but why don't I have to do that? it's symmetric I don't have to do that. Now I have x transpose a inverse pre multiplied and x transpose x. So those terms there cancel out. And what I'm left with is sigma <coughs> square and one x transpose x inverse. That was one way of getting around. Definition for up there. You have to make the second order positive derivatives with respect to theta. If do the first order positive derivative here, right? We can do the second order positive derivative in here. We do this off. Basically, you just have to do the positive derivative of, and here I have to keep track of the minus 2. Minus 2 x transpose on y minus x theta. Before I get my fingers. Now, here you only have one theta, so everything is fairly easy. A minus layer as well, and two of course goes outside, but this minus cancels this minus when we do the differentiation. So what we're left with here is two times x transpose x. If we take the definition from up there, then what we should get is the variance of theta hat is equal to 2 times the estimate of sigma hat square times the inverse of the second order derivative so it's the inverse of this that I'll just take the one half first and then x transpose x inverse and of course those twos they cancel out. So we get sigma square x transpose x inverse just as we got over there. So both by using the general definition and by using the calculation rules for the variance, of course we get to the same expression, otherwise we made an error somewhere, but nevertheless it's nice to end up in the same place. Very brief example. We have some observations Y out here. Started with the red dots. 
perhaps more ridiculous set here. But we have five observations at five time points. And we'll get back to the original model that is quadratic in set, but linear in parameters. And then the question is, can we do something about this? Of course we can. What we have to do is we take the data, we organize our design matrix so that the fir first column is a column of ones corresponding to the intercept. Then we have a column containing the sets corresponding to the set here. And then we have a column corresponding to set square out here. That way we have organized the linear model for all five observations. Equation. That's what we want to do, and now we basically just have to do this to get an estimate. You can also do the uncertainty. I didn't actually add that here. I would normally or I would consider doing that, but let's just look at how does this perform. So we have to fit. Y is the absurd value, and Y hat are the fitted values, so the green ones are the estimates we made, and we can look at the particulars now from a sample of five observations. You cannot say much about the performance of residuals. In this case, we had five observations, and we estimated three parameters. So, if we were to make an estimate of the variance, we would first have to make an estimator of sigma square, where you would divide by n minus p, which would be divided by 2. So we are down to a point where our degrees of freedom, we would want to have some more before really starting doing things. Technically, we can do it, but we don't want to do that. So to conclude the first part here, Promises of the ordinary least squares estimate. First of all, it's a linear function of the observations. As we can see down here, we can write it as L operator on Y. That's one last thing. We call it also general linear model. It's unbiased. I have proven that, but the estimate. The expectation of this estimator is the true value. And we got a definition of an estimator for the variance of the estimator, and it's so called blue. Best linear unbiased estimator. Saying that it has the smallest variance among all estimators that are linear functions of the observations. That's a typical. Then there are other kinds of models where you say, I will accept some bias and do other things for robustness. That may be great in some cases. Not the core focus here. We focus on the case where you can say, we assume that the model assumptions are fulfilled. Otherwise, we'll try to do something so that they are better fulfilled. I think this is the best time. Take a break, so let's resume five minutes to nine.